In this episode, I'm going to focus on one of the most recurring themes found throughout the AP Art History curriculum, power and authority. This video thematically compares a Western work from the Byzantine era, Justinian and his attendants, with a non-Western African work from the Benin civilization, one of the many Oba and his attendants, Walplex. So let's first get started with some of the info regarding Emperor Justinian's very famous mosaics made during the 6th century CE. Justinian and his attendants is a mosaic found in the apse of the Church of San Vitale, located in the northern Italian city of Ravenna. The capital of the Byzantine Empire at this time, established by the late Roman Emperor Constantine the Great, was Constantinople, now known as the Turkish city of Istanbul. Istanbul was Constantinople, now it's Istanbul. Justinian was one of the most powerful and successful Byzantine emperors early on in its history. He was able to push the borders of the empire to their furthest point while he was in charge. One of the many cities that Justinian General Belisarius reconquered that was part of the territories once held by the former Roman Empire was the city of Ravenna, which in turn became the Byzantine capital in the west. While Justinian and his famous queen Theodora lived in Constantinople and were never believed to have ever visited Ravenna, it was very important for Justinian, as it was for the great Roman emperors that were his predecessors, to communicate his power and authority as emperor to the citizens of this newly acquired territory of Ravenna. The Church of San Vitale is a relatively austere looking building on the outside and has a very unique double octagon plan with an oddly abutted narthex. But the inside is filled with luxurious marble paneling and intricate detailed mosaics that depict biblical tales and aim to glorify God, along with portraying the power and authority of the Byzantine leader himself. It's in the apse of San Vitale where we find the Justinian mosaic. It is conveniently and purposefully placed on the right hand side of the mosaic of Christ the Savior above the apse. Traditionally in Christian art, those to the right hand of Christ are those who are saved and will go to heaven. Justinian stands near the center of the mosaic and is the only figure donning a purple robe and crown, indicating his royal status. And he also has a solid golden nimbus, or halo, which indicates a connection to the divine. Justinian also holds a paten containing the bread of the Eucharist used during communion. While I don't recommend focusing too much on the mosaic of Theodora and San Vitale in your class, it's important to make sure that your students know that her mosaic is of equal size and directly across the apse from the Justinian mosaic. Theodora shares similar royal regalia and also holds the wine chalice used in communion. This ties her to her husband, not only by what she wears and how she is positioned, but because together they have the bread and wine used in communion, which would have occurred at the altar just below the mosaics. While Theodora's mosaic is located on the wall to Christ's left, the intention would not have been to portray her as damned. Theodora was simply not as important as Justinian, who, as emperor, would automatically get the prize spot on Christ's right. Theodora's mere presence in the mosaic program of San Vitale indicates her value to the empire. It speaks to the love and admiration her husband had for her, along with the large role she played in Byzantine politics while her husband reigned. Back to the Justinian mosaic. To Justinian's left stands Maximianus, the bishop of San Vitale who would have overseen the construction of the church and completion of all mosaics inside on Justinian's behalf. His is the only name that appears on the mosaic itself. The men wearing white on both Justinian's left and right are all members of the church, and the men clustered into the panel on Justinian's far right are members of the guard, or Justinian's army. While the clergy takes up two-thirds of this mosaic, this work altogether communicates that Justinian is the leader of both church and state, which made him quite different from the Roman emperors that preceded him. It's also important to bring the total number of attendants from both the clergy and the guard that flank Justinian to your students' attention. There are 12 total, which parallels the number of Christ's apostles, thus aligning Justinian with Christ himself. Christ, Justinian, and Theodora are the only figures in the apse wearing cloaks of deep purple, tying the three of them together symbolically yet again. Unlike the emperors that dominated the once vast, now fallen Roman Empire that came before the Byzantine era, Justinian was a Christian leader. Instead of making massive monuments with huge size conveying the power and authority of a ruler, Justinian's statements were more subtle and symbolic, referencing the stories and ethereal nature of the now dominant religion of Christianity. Justinian dons a golden nimbus, and both he and his attendants hover in an undefined golden space that doesn't seem as if it could exist on earth, which was precisely the point. Justinian conveys his power by showing us the army he has at his disposal. Usually, power is shown as might. But because of this work's location within a church, he conveys through this mosaic the authority or the right he has to rule the empire 
which has been bestowed to him by Christ. A great work of African art to compare with Justinian and his attendants is the equestrian Oba wall plaque of the Benin culture, which is located in the country we now know as Nigeria. To the Benin people, the Oba is the king, who, like many great emperors of Western civilizations, was seen as being a sacred and divine individual. While I'm only going to be focusing on one of these plaques during this video, there are actually hundreds of these plaques that were found and taken from the Benin Palace in Nigeria during the British Punitive Expedition of 1897. A little bit of political context is necessary for students to grasp before looking at a sampling of the Oba plaques. In the late 1800s, Britain wanted to expand their trade into Western Africa. The British sent an envoy of people to discuss these trade possibilities with the sitting Oba at the time. But the Brits were informed to stay away because the sitting Oba was participating in annual sacrifices in honor of his ancestors and would be too busy to meet. But the unarmed British envoy did not heed this advice and began to travel the fierce terrain towards Benin City in order to meet with the Oba. After only a short distance, the group of nearly 300 was ambushed and nearly 250 of them were killed. Word of the mass slaughter reached the British mainland quickly, and the British Punitive Expedition of 1897 was organized. Over 700 men were brought to Benin City where they captured it, then looted and burned the palace of the Oba to atone for the deaths of the British lives lost in the earlier ambush. During the seizure of the palace, British soldiers were amazed to discover enormous quantities of art objects, many of which were the Oba plaques like the one we are discussing. This is actually kind of sad because it indicates that the British did not believe that the Benin people had the artistic capabilities to create such beautiful works of art. The plaques of the Obas were thought to have been made in matching pairs and hung on opposing wooden pillars around the Benin Palace. They all glorify the status of the king, proclaim his power and authority, and sometimes even commemorate his specific achievements. The placement and succession of the Oba plaques within the palace is not known for certain, because when the British troops removed the works from the walls of the palace, they didn't document their sequence or placement, so it's really difficult to recreate in museums how they would have originally looked. Collections of the Oba plaques and other Benin artworks litter museums around the globe. Over time, the Oba plaques have become famously known as the Benin bronzes, because some Benin artwork was made of bronze. But this is actually a misnomer for many of the plaques for the Obas, because most of them, like the one we're focusing on here, are actually made of brass, which is a similar metal but far less expensive than bronze. Now on to the cross-cultural comparison. After studying the Justinian mosaic and then providing your students with political background about the Oba and his Edo people, it's a great time to show them one specific wall plaque from Oba's palace. I suggest this one, sometimes referred to as the equestrian Oba in his attendance because he rides a horse. It was made during the 16th century and it is one of the 250 works on the new AP Art History Global Curriculum Framework. First things first. Show an image of the Oba plaque to your students and have them study it for a minute or two on their own. Ask them to write down a list of the ways that the importance of the Oba is emphasized in the plaque. After giving them a few minutes, have them raise their hands and share their observations. You'll probably get responses like, He's in the middle! He's the biggest! He wears lots of special stuff that nobody else wears! He's riding a horse! And this is all true. Your students on their own can recognize the importance of the Oba and how the artists of this plaque chose to emphasize it. The most important tool to use in the classroom at this point is comparing and contrasting the two works side by side. Like Justinian, the Oba is in the center of his composition. While Justinian wears a crown and dons the Christian golden nimbus, the Oba wears special beads made of coral. Coral symbolizes his divine status and his power because they connect the Oba with the ruler of the waters. Even today, the ruling Obas of Benin are the only people in the society that wear necklaces and garments made of coral. While Justinian is flanked in his mosaic by the entities that gave him both power and authority, the church and the state, the Oba is flanked by his servants that shield only him from the sun, and whose importance is made obvious by their small stature in this hierarchical composition. Power and authority is one of the most recurring themes throughout art history. When following a Western timeline, you have plenty of other opportunities to make cross-cultural connections with global cultures. Some other non-Western works I suggest weaving into thematic power and authority comparisons are The Palette of King Narmer, an Egyptian artwork, The Victory Stele of Naram Sin, an Akkadian artwork, and The Terracotta Army of Emperor Qin, a Chinese work of art.
Don't forget to check out all the links below the video. And be sure to check out our next episode that deals with the theme of nature.